about a year, a little over a year ago, I got home early from work and I beat my wife home, my daughter. They came home and I was sleeping on the couch. My eyes don't close. Like this is me with my eyes closed. So my daughter uh, thought I was awake. And she come running in the house, being a young kid, she wants to jump on and play with daddy. So she come running in and she jumped on me. And now to wake me up at this time, you had to squeeze my feet to wake me up. In other words, I go into a severe flashback. So she jumps on me. I grab her, I threw her across the room. She got hurt. My wife is sitting here trying to hold me down, trying to wake me up, trying to deal with my daughter. You know, I wake up, I'm confused. I whack my head. There's blood over the place. Hello and welcome to another episode of Bunny Hugs and Mental Health. I am your host, Todd Rennebaum. This episode is sponsored by SUN, the Saskatchewan Union of Nurses, and it is so appreciated. Thank you so much, not just for sponsoring, but just for being nurses and being wonderful human beings. Much appreciated. Thank you for joining me and everyone else that's listening. This is an incredible episode. I mean... I say it all the time, and I mean it all the time, Uh, but this one's a man. Jeremy Evans is an incredible dude. Uh, I cannot wait for you to hear this story. Um, I mean, just the story alone of him and a bear is amazing, Uh, but then the the wonderful things he's doing about PTSD and his plans to to advocate for it and stuff, Uh, he's just a really great guy. Uh, great story and yeah a, a strong survivor of not just a bear attack but PTSD so we're gonna hear all about that soon but first a bit of business first off I'm gonna I would talk about next week's episode uh, it is with three incredibly lovely ladies Laura's mud Christy Mason and Aaron Jello they all have worked with animals in the past and uh, little did I know veterinarians uh, it's a profession that's very, very high uh, for for suicide rates. Uh, so we talk about that, and we just talk about uh, animal health and animal health care, and and uh, just some of the mental health issues that people that work in that field uh, come across. It's something you never think about, but uh, it happens a lot. And uh, I open up a bit because I, when I was 18 years old, I worked in an animal shelter, and I was an 18 year old boy putting animals down uh yeah anyway we talk and it's a really really great conversation that's another really incredible episode so listen to that next week also this coming monday april 17th i will be doing an instagram live uh with a young lady bonnie faith and i don't remember what time it's at but you can follow me at bunny hugs podcast on instagram and i will be posted on i'll have it posted on there with times and stuff uh, she is a mental health advocate she has bipolar too and uh, she's come out with a new workbook thing anyway it's gonna be another really great conversation with another great person who's doing wonderful things so that's instagram on monday night april 17th and in the weeks to follow there's gonna be all types of other great conversations with Uh, people on the podcast and on instagram so please follow the podcast listen to the podcast tell people about the podcast and rate and review the podcast please i can't explain how important that is and one more thing april 10th two years ago was the very first uh, episode was released of bunny hugs and mental health so it's been two years of podcasting uh for the first summer i was only doing it every other week for a little bit but uh so the, the math doesn't quite work out, but uh, it's also the ni- 90th episode. Uh, so that's really, really cool. I'm very proud and uh, I'm very, very grateful for all the wonderful, wonderful guests and all the wonderful listeners and followers and, and all the support and, and everyone that's, you know, gotten something from the podcast. And uh, yeah, it's just been amazing. So that's two years of this and 90 episodes. So anyway, let's listen to this 90th episode. Uh, with bear attack survivor and PTSD advocate and survivor, Jeremy Evans. Oh, wait, I screwed that up. So without further ado, I give you Jeremy Evans. <laughs> All right, so I, went, I was out uh, sheep hunting. I left my truck at, uh, I drove out to the place where I go sheep hunting, and I arrived there about 2.30 in the morning. And uh, I got on my truck, hopped on my bicycle, and um, and rode my bike in back in a little over twelve kilometers to where I normally look for sheep. 
Uh, so I rode my bike out there in the moonlight, nice fresh air, kind of love it, nobody out there. So I got all the way to the back. Uh, when you get to the back, where, the, where you get to where the trail ends, it kind of goes from like two ruts down to down to a horse trail, from there down to a game trail, and then it goes through some pretty steep drainages. And then you kind of pop out near the end of the end of the valley or yeah, I guess the end of the valley. Um, maybe we're uh, North Burnt Timber Creek comes out of the mountain. There's a nice little bowl in the back and I, I spent all summer in there looking for sheep. And so I was head out there the day before opening day. What time of year is it? Fall? This is August, August 24th. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so my whole plan was to spend four days out there. I get there the day before sheep season opened up, uh, set up camp, find my ram, harvest them, and then hike out, and then have a day to relax before going back to work. Uh, so I'm out there. It's about, I want to say, nine in the morning. And I got up to the one drainage there, and as I got up the drainage, there's the, the spruce trees kind of end, and then there's more of short willows, and the trees are really short. I spotted some sheep. And I got pretty excited. So, you know, watching the sheep, taking a step, watching the sheep for 10 minutes, you know, taking another few more steps, watching the sheep, just trying to figure out where they're going to go and where I'm going to set up camp. Uh, one, and then I spotted some rams. And I was sitting there with my elbows on the handlebars watching sheep. And then I stood up to reposition, you know, as I stepped to reposition, I noticed a little brown thing run in front of me. It was less than 10 feet away, and I knew right away what it was. It was uh, it was a grizzly bear cub. And it, I, I got this feeling of, oh, shit, because there's the cub, where is mama? And this thing was super close. So I was reaching out of my backpack to grab my bear spray, and as I was reaching down in there, I heard a branch break over my right shoulder. And as I turned to look, there was mama. She was less than an arm's reach away. She had her right paw stretched straight out to grab me. I could see her teeth, her mouth was slightly open. You could see the whites of her eyes on the left side. And I really had like half a second to react. I uh, grabbed the frame of my bicycle and threw it in front of her and stepped aside. Her head went right between the frame of the bicycle and she had it on like a necklace. She turned, looked at me and first thing I did was grab my frame pack and I smashed her in the face with it and then started beating her on the head. Uh, she managed to get a hold of my right hand and pinch it against the backpack, uh, crushing my hand a bit. She let go, and then I started to keep bashing her in the face and in the head. Um, then she turned and started to walk away. And I was like, oh, good. I started to walk backwards and watching her and trying to pull my bear spray on my backpack. As I was trying to pull the bear spray on my backpack, she spun around and came charging in a second time. I call this beginning of round two. As she turned around and came charging in, I chucked my backpack at her and I decided I was going to run up the mountainside. And the whole plan was to run up the mountainside and kind of jump off the steep hill into a tree, hopefully get enough height and she won't be able to get me. Well, I found a nice tree, about an eight inch caliber tree, not a very big one, but it was the only tree in the hills I can climb. <laughs> <laughs> I jumped into the tree and I got about five feet up. My right leg was hanging low and I was trying to pull it up. Well, she got to the base of the tree right behind me and you can hear her just huffing like <laughs> she stood up on her hind legs and uh wrapped her wrapped her paws around my right leg and was bringing it down in her mouth and i just remember looking down and seeing her mouth come up going right behind the right knee i was thinking this is gonna hurt hmm. and she grabbed on and i don't remember feeling any pain but she grabbed on and she shook her head down pulled me out of the tree just like nothing uh, so I hit the ground very hard and I curl up in a ball underneath the spruce tree and I wrapped my arms and legs around the trunk and was holding on. She was digging at me quite aggressively with her claws, trying to get at me and the spruce brows were protecting me, which is, you know, kind of good. <laughs> hmm. uh, and she got fed up with it and she reached in with her mouth and she grabbed me by the side on the left side, uh, in the kind of love handle area, grabbed me by there, picked me up and threw me about six feet. And so I hit the ground extremely hard. I was out of breath, trying to catch my breath. And I curl up into a ball. And I was just curling up in her ball. She she was on me instantly. Like it was just, I had no time to take that breath, nothing. And then her first bite was on the left side of my face. 
her uh, canine teeth caught on either side of my eye, right up in the corner of my nose and my tear duct, and the other side of my eye, and she crunched down, crushing the whole left side of my face. Um, you know, that was the first bite, and I, I remember sitting there thinking, like, well, this sucks playing dead, right? Like, chewing on me, get, getting chewed on sucks. So I rolled over to my back, started punching her in the face with my right arm, poking her nose, poking her eye, grabbing her ear. She was snapping up my hands, and I was trying to you know, deter her from biting me. Uh, then she came down to bite me a second time in the face. And this was like a, it was like a great moment because when she came down, it was just a perfect, her head was in a perfect position for me to punch my left hand into her mouth. And as I punched my left hand into her mouth, I remember feeling her tongue and having my fingers slide along her tongue and feel the bumps like leather and all the little scars and everything. And then my hand, I, well, I wrapped my Fingers around her tongue and my index finger, middle finger went down into her throat and I was holding on to her tongue for dear life. She started to gag and choke, making like a kind of like a pig squeal or grunt and gagging. Her uh, back legs were digging into the side of me, the right side of me, because she was over top. And I was trying to push her hindquarters to get her legs off of me. Uh, and as I was doing that, my hand slipped and I hit the belly. And I knew it was the belly because you could tell by the thinner hair, more soft skin. I reached up and grabbed at the time what I thought was balls. It was just basically a big hunk of loose skin. I grabbed that, twisted and pulled, and she made a horrible sound, just like a pig, like a, <clears throat> and then started squealing like a deep pig. Hand in her mouth, whenever I had, it was causing her pain. And I was holding on, squeezing, and then I felt comfortable enough that I let, I let go. She ran back the way she came, and you can, she was just defecating all across the mountainside and squealing like a pig, just running away. I was like, okay, good. That's over with. So I stood up, dusted myself off, what, got to my pack. Was your eye still in your socket? Like, uh, My eye was still my eye was still there. I was just... Just your face? Chunk of my face was missing, was crushed. Mm -hmm. So I, I got back to my pack and opened up my pack, and the first thing I did was pull up my cell phone, and I took a selfie of myself to see what it looked like mm. and so in the selfie you could see that my left side of my face was crushed and there's a bunch of skin missing on parts of my head so i took that picture and i'm looking at it and going well that sucks you know um but i could still go over there and shoot that sheep or i can go look for this bear i think a little bit of shock was kicking in i suppose yeah <laughs> <laughs> so as i'm sitting there on the hillside i, I pulled my gun off my pack and i was leaning against a stump kind of debating what i should do and about, say, about seven to ten minutes have gone by, and, you know, I'm kind of like, okay, what do I do? What do I do? So I was loading up my gun. I had the gun against my left shoulder, and I had the clip in my hand, and I was pushing shells into the clip. As I was doing that, I heard a sound of ice breaking, and my arms just dropped to my side. Everything went numb. She had come back and grabbed me by the back of the skull, and she started to drag me back into the bush. And I just remember seeing her paws come on the side of me, digging into the ground, and she was just huffing and just dragging, kind of like a dog when you uh, have like a um, pulling tug of war and you kind of growl and you get real dug dig in. So she was dragging me back. Uh, I remember dragging, dragged through some bushes, and and then uh, I was kind of sitting on my butt, leaning against something. I think it was her front legs, and I remember her. Paw, come over the right side of my face, catch me in the corner of my nose and mouth on the right side of my face, and it just cut right into my face, um, removing all the skin, my ear on the right side. And I remember her other paw was around my shoulder, and she started chewing on my neck and on the back of my skull and just gnawing at me like a dog bone, like just grinding away. So she was sitting there chewing away and ripping and tearing, and I couldn't do nothing. I, I, uh, I was almost like paralyzed. It felt like she must have repositioned. I fell back and I was laying on the ground. At this point in time, my uh, left eye was hanging out of the socket, hanging down. Mm. My right eye was smashed into my skull. Actually, I didn't think I had a right eye. And large majority of my face, the skin has been removed. So I'm, now I'm laying on my back. I could, I could feel something above me. I could kind of see a dark object. I reached up with both hands. I felt something that was soft, grabbed both hands, twisted and pulled. 
and I wrapped my legs around her head and neck and kind of locked them in like a UFC fighter type thing. And whatever I had, I was going to rip off. And so I was pulling on it as hard as I could. Legs wrapped around her neck. She rolled around the mountainside, jumping and bucking like a bronco and just deep, deep squeal. And she started to roll around and toss me around like a rag doll, but I was holding on for dear life. I then uh, felt comfortable enough that she got the hint. I let go. She ran down the mountainside and just squealing, re- like really squealing as she ran away. That was so round I, three. This was around, this is the end of round three. It's correct. Jesus. So when she took off, I was unable to stand. I couldn't see. And if in order to look forward, I had to tilt my head back or I had to uh, pick up my left eye and hold it up and look around. Uh, I was feeling my face and I could feel skull and everything was, my whole eye sockets were just smashed. My nose was gone. We're just hanging there. Um, so I, I couldn't stand. I crawled down the hill and I managed to find the trail and then I crawled, found my pack right away. Uh, and I found my gun feeling around. I found my gun right away. And then I tried to put a shell in the chamber and as I was trying to put it in the chamber, I, I couldn't, my fingers were uh, you know, broken and facing different ways. So I couldn't get a shell down the chamber. I couldn't see. And I was panicking because I needed the clip. As I was feeling around for the clip, the first thing I found was my mustache and goatee. And then I found a chunk of my face, then my right ear. And then I found and then I found the clip. Slammed it in the gun. And the first thing that was dark to me got three bullets. Just bang, bang, bang. Um so then I got so after a picking up all these pieces of my face and all that. I'm sitting there going like, what do I do? Like, I'm not going to make it. Um, so I pulled on my phone and sent my wife a message, let her know that I was mauled by a bear and that I'm not going to make it. And, you know, I'm sitting there kind of debating, what should I do? You know, I, I can't stand, I can't walk. Um, I'm bleeding all over the place. My whole skin off my head is removed. So I, I decided I was going to commit suicide. And that, so I figured it'd be, you know, the best way to go. Did you, so I loaded up the gun, put my... Sorry, did you, you had kids at home at this point too? You had, yeah, I had an eight-month-old daughter at this time. A, a one-month-old? Eight-month. Eight-month, oh, sorry, okay. Eight-month, sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about my wife and my daughter. You know, I'm never going to see her again. I'm never going to see her graduate, grow up, walk down the aisles. Never going to see my wife again, you know, my first true love. And it was, a, it was really tough to put my goodbyes on a text message and send it to her. I, I knew she wasn't going to see the messages. I had no signal, but I wanted to at least let her know that I tried. And I wanted to know her to know how bad it was. Because uh, I wanted to think I, I just gave up. Well, so if they found so your I, phone or something too, like they find your body, then they find your phone. I guess the message would be there too. Correct. Right, and that was the whole purpose of. So when they found me that she actually knew what I went through and it wasn't just, you know, like a little bite night. Yeah. Right. Um, so I'm sitting there kind of debating, you know, well, I just made my decision and I blew up the gun and stuck the the gun against the ground and the barrel against my chin and I pulled the trigger. Um, the, the gun just clicked. It just went click. And I was like, what was that? So I moved the gun away and I cocked it again and I pulled the trigger and it just sent a bullet inches away from my head. And that scared me. I was like, what am I thinking? Like, what am I doing? Uh, no one's going to find me where I'm at right now. I'm so far back in that no one's going to find me for a very long time. And I, my wife deserves a quick answer. Like she deserves me, someone to find me right away and let her know so she's not worrying because we got a young daughter at home. So then I decided that, made the decision that, that uh, I'm going to try to make it to the next trail, make it across the drainage where more people go. Um, so I gathered up my pieces of my face and I put a sweatshirt on upside down on my head and a long sleeve shirt, opened it up the body of the shirt and I laid the layers of the pieces of my face on top of my scalp, folded the shirt up and then, then uh, my jaw was all hanging down on the left side. Everything was all the skin was removed and muscles. So then I tied a knot underneath my chin to help hold my jaw up. And then I tied two knots on the back of my head to help hold my Head straight, tied really tight. And then uh, I tried to stand, stand up. And, you know, the first 10 feet, I probably fell over a hundred times. I couldn't get, I couldn't get on my feet. 
Uh, my right leg just would give out. All the ligaments were severed at the knee. And I had a chunk missing on the inner, my inner thigh. And I also had a big chunk missing on uh, the left side of my, uh, where my love handle was. And a pretty severe wound there. And so I'd stand up, try to take a step, fall over. And I'd get back up again and take another step. Excuse me. So the first 100 feet of the trail, it leads down the edge. It's a rocky trail, leads down the edge of a drainage. And it's pretty steep. It's probably the most steepest part of the whole hike. So I started making my way down there and I lost my footing. And I tumbled head over heels all the way down to the bottom of the drainage, you know, a few hundred feet, all the way down, down over this little cliff and into some massive boulders. But I'm there, I'm laying there, I'm pretty mangled up. I'm in a lot of pain now. I can hardly move and I'm I've given up. This is this is where my final resting place is. So I pulled on my phone and text my wife and let her know that I tried. You know, I sent her my one last goodbye and it was, I tried, honey. So I'm laying there in the boulders, you know, and I'm just thinking, I, I, I can't go on. And I turned to the music on my phone and I played the last song that I played the night before for my daughter when I was putting her to bed, which was Baby Shark. Oh God, don't get so, it in my head. <laughs> so I'm laying there on the rocks listening to baby shark and just that song now means so much more to me hmm. it uh it gave me the strength the power i needed to actually crawl back up the other side of that drainage i i wanted to make it somewhere where they're going to find the body like i knew i wasn't going to make it i just wanted to make it 10 more feet down the trail up to the next rock to the next tree hmm. And I just remember crawling my way through, you know, focusing on, I'm going to make it to that rock. And I get to that rock. And I'm like, okay, you know, I'm going to make it to that next rock. I get to the next rock. I'm going to make it to that little bush. And every every rock, stump, patch of bush was its own little challenge and sucking away little little energy I had. But I was driven I was driven to see my family again, the determination. You know, it was all, I just wanted to be, I just wanted to do this for them. I wanted to make it somewhere where they're going to find the body. And throughout the whole the whole journey out, I set all these little mini goals. I'm just I'm gonna make it to that tree. I'm gonna make it to the next trail. I'm gonna make it to the outfitters camp. And you know, when I when you set those mini goals, I achieved incredible things that day. Well, I'm here today. I, I didn't give up. I, you know, the whole time thinking about my family and wanting to be with them. And that was one of the biggest drivers on that day. Hmm. That's uh it, it's that's pretty amazing. I mean, and it's like, it is a bit like life, isn't it? It's like, you can get overwhelmed thinking about the entire thing, but you just take it one day at a time, be present now and set small goals. And it's amazing what, uh, how, well, how you can you, achieve. Yeah. Cause if I was thinking about, I'm going to make it, I'm going to go to the truck. I would have never have made it. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking, you know, get to the next tree, get to the next trail. And when you set those many goals, it started to create a sense of, of uh, accomplishment. Well, it, yeah, and it erased my sense of powerlessness at the moment. You know, I didn't think about how the situation I was in. I was just more, you know, I can do this. It started building more and more, more momentum. And as I achieved more and more of those many goals, you said it erased my sense of powerlessness. It, despite the gore and despite the reality at the moment, it, it was a huge confidence builder. Hmm. Did Baby Shark play the whole time? Oh uh, yes, the baby baby shark played on repeat for the whole entire hike out, even to well, I made it to my truck, and then once I got to my truck, I hopped in it. I remember starting the truck up and looking out the front windshield, and I couldn't see the end of the hood. I rolled down the window, and I couldn't see the ground. I was like, "Oh, where? How am I going to get out of here?" All I could see was like just dark green on the sides. And a light spot in the middle. So there was, there was a heavily uh, spruce tree area. And I figured the light spot was the center of the road and the green was was the edge of the road. And so in between that and off I went. Uh, so it was about 22 kilometer drive from where I was to the first place for help. Man, with, you were uh, in the is, middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> So the, the road out of there, it, 
get uh, does has lots of twists and turns. A couple, well, it's got a drop off on the a cliff, drop off on the one side quite a bit. It's got two very tight serpentine turns in it. Yeah. Um, there's a guardrail, not really a guardrail, just like a steel post and a cable that kind of run all along the road. And I thought I was lead, I was hitting that all the way down, just using that as my guide. I, I guess I didn't because my truck was in pretty good shape. <laughs> but. <laughs> Huh. I made it to the, uh, to this resort or well, it's Panther river resort. It's like a campground and a place you can stay in cabins in the middle of nowhere. So I pull into there, uh, full parking lot. And I try to park in between some vehicles just cause I'm, you know, kind of want to be polite, not drive up to the lodge. <laughs> I, I couldn't, uh, still in shock. I apparently. Could, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't, uh, fit in between the two vehicles. So I said, screw it. I'm going to drive right up to the front door of the lodge. So I drove right up to the front door and parked right, and there's like a, a ramp going up, and the building's kind of like an octagon. And then I walk up this ramp, and I was there uh, the week before we stayed there, my wife and I and daughter, we stayed there, so I kind of knew the layout. I get up on top of their balcony, and this is a, it's an old wood cabin in a, shaped like an octagon, and it has long uh, trusses that come down, log trusses that stick out onto the onto the balcony but when you're walking in i'm tall enough i hit my head on him so i was tilting my head making sure i didn't hit him and i can't really see and the whole front of it is all windows so you can see so you, people could see out and i noticed this little shadow in the window and the small kid size run away from the window and at this point in time i was opening up the door to the to the lodge and I just hear this little boy say, uh, grandma, grandma, someone's trying to play a prank on us. Cause I literally look like a zombie. I'm wearing shorts, t-shirt. I'm covered in blood. Got this paper towel and toilet paper kind of wrapped up, holding my head together with some S- medical tape and that. And a sweatshirt. Yeah. And, uh, and I know walking and I'm missing my face and you're like, walking in like one room, non-smoking please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I get into the lodge and, uh, you know, I, I could kind of mumble and talk a little bit. And I was like, you know, I need some help. I got mauled by a bear. And they're like, oh my God, what can we do for you? And you know, I handed him my wallet, my license and said, here's my name, grab a pen, call my wife, let her know I'm all right. And then, uh, I asked for a glass of medium temperature water, no ice and a straw. Oh, you're fussy. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, very fussy. <laughs> Come on, I just fought off a bear. I should get what I want. Right? I said, no straw. So I'm, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm sitting there in the lodge and they're trying to call, they're calling 911, trying to get a helicopter or something in there. And then, uh, as they're, oh, as they're in there trying to get the uh, call in the helicopter and that, um, the, uh, I was in there bleeding all over the place and blood dripping all over the floor. So I got on my knees and I started to clean the floor and clean off the tables. I was making quite a mess. Uh, so I was, as I was cleaning up the leg, I was like, what are you doing? Like, get up. Like, you know, and, um, and then they, they took me out of there and threw me in my truck. And from there, they decided that they were going to move me to the back side of the lodge in my truck to wait for the helicopter. And as we were sitting there, the uh, ladies in the lodge were running back and forth across the parking lot. And they could just check and give me updates and let me make sure I'm all right. And they kept running back and forth. And I was yelling at them, go, like, hey, guys, like, calm down. You know, like, I'm just missing my face. You guys just need to calm down and focus. You know, I was more worried about them making a mistake and getting hurt. And I have to help them all or them making a mistake. And I would die because when people are in that panic situation, they don't quite make clear decisions. Mm-hmm. So I was trying to keep them calm and, uh, there was a, a young lady, she was 18 at the time that was actually at the truck with me, uh, that was sitting there making sure I was all right. And I was talking to her and, uh, just, you know, what do you do when you're sitting there missing your face, trying to have a conversation, right? So I'd ask like, what's your name? How old are you? You know, do you have a boyfriend? What do you do for fun? Just, just trying to keep the mood light. <laughs> Does he have a face? Yeah, <laughs> I see. I can't believe this, man. The shit you went through, and then you're trying to keep other people calm. Yeah, well, you know, like when people panic, it was scaring me because I, I, you know, I was tempted just to drive to Sundry, which is about an hour and a half away from where I was. 
I was just going to say, I'm just going to drive straight to there because who wants to help me? Everybody's going to be freaking out, you know, and they're like, oh my God. Um, Did you see yourself you know, in the mirror? You. Like in your rear view mirror no. or anything? You avoided it on no, purpose? Was, I did. I ripped my mirror off and, and removed the window because I, uh, the, the side mirror, I knew it wasn't good. <laughs> Otherwise you'd be like them. <laughs> you'd be panicking like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. And, and so the... Uh, the one lady came and said, you know, her stars wasn't coming out, but her father was, he owned a helicopter and he was coming out to do, uh, uh, to fly out, to pick me up, take me to sundry. Hmm. So she was like, he'll be here in about a half hour, 45 minutes. And I'm like, okay, no problem. So I got out of the truck and I, uh, I grabbed, tried to grab my fishing rod out of the back and I was going to go do some fishing because there's, there's a stream there. <laughs> It's got great bull trout fishing. Heck, if I'm going to wait 45 minutes for a helicopter, I'm going to at least do some fishing. Fucking one track mind. That's right. You know, I just, <laughs> I wanted to go in to do that. Well, you know, I'm, so I'm trying to get my rod out and the one lady's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I want to go fishing. She's like, no, you're not. Get back in the damn truck. I'm like, no, I'm going to go fishing. I took three days She's off like, work for this. You know, <laughs> That's right. <clears throat> She's like, get back in your truck. All right. So I got back in my truck and. And I was sitting there like, well, can we take my boots off, you know, because my feet kind of hurt. And she's like, no, just sit there. Just like, can you just like calm down and wait? Registered nurses are on the front lines of this nursing crisis right now. I feel like we don't have all of the resources and the tools and the staff to ensure patient safety 100% of the time. Everyone is trying their best, but it's not sustainable the way we're going right now. There needs to be something changing. The nurses across Saskatchewan need to be involved in conversations with the government to try and find solutions. We have ideas, we just need to be involved. This has been a message from the Saskatchewan Union of Nurses. So the helicopter arrives and uh, I walk over, hop in the helicopter in the back and it was really fancy. From what I could tell, the helicopter is really fancy. Uh, like, like top of the line it had like six seats in it big helicopter they got this tarp in there and they helped me get in so i'm in the helicopter and uh you know they normally put the earmuffs over you and, well i couldn't hear so i didn't have any ears they didn't give me the earmuffs so <laughs> it was quite loud i remember the helicopter taking off and i was really trying to look out the window because i haven't been in a helicopter in the mountains in a while right so i was like trying to focus and look out the window and and I was just really like staring out the window, trying to get a glimpse of what it looked like, but I can't see and everything's, you know, so blurry. And Do you still have an eye dangling? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah my left eye was still dangling out. My right eye, I thought it was completely gone. So I, like, I couldn't really see what was going on. <laughs> so I'm trying to look out the window and I was leaning over, trying to look out the window and I'd feel this poke in my right side, really hard poke. And I turn and look and it was uh, Amanda, the lady at the lodge, she was poking me. And as I turned my head to look at her, she'd pull this tarp up high and I wouldn't be able to see her face. I'm like, what the, f what, what's going on? So then I go back out, look out the window and then I get this large jab on the side again. I turn my head and there she is holding the tarp up again. I'm like, what are we playing peekaboo here? Like, leave me alone. Just trying to look out the window. Well, what it turns out was she thought I was passing out. So she's trying to wake me up. And then when I turned to look at her, blood would squirt out and she was holding the tarp up to cover herself. But to me, it just looked like she's trying to play peekaboo. Good Lord. So. So anyways, we landed in uh, Sundry and uh, I could tell there's people outside the helicopter. Everybody looked like they're just like lollygagging, just kind of like standing there, like, doot, doot, like, you know, no one's in a rush. They opened up the door to the helicopter from my side and I remember I turned and looked and I said, hi. And then shock set in. People started going crazy. Uh, one of the doctors tried cutting in the back of the helicopter around the other side of the helicopter, but there's an open tail rotor. So mm. Amanda, she jumps out, dives, tackles, tackles this helicopter, or tackles the doctor, trying to hold him down, trying to fight with him because, uh. He'd get his head he, cut off. Yeah. And she's like, there's an open tail rotor, like, wait till it stops. And, and everybody's trying to pull me out. So she's yelling at the doctors and nurses saying like, you know, he can get out. He got in, just leave him be. So I'm trying to get my leg out. And at this point in time, my right leg was, uh, totally straight, seized straight. I couldn't bend it. I was trying to get over the seat and everybody, you know, trying to grab and drag me out. And then I just feel these two little arms come underneath my chest, underneath my armpits around my chest and pick me up from behind. This uh, little nurse climbed in the back of the helicopter, 
wrapped her arms around me and just slid me right out like nothing. Hmm. They threw me in a gurney and off I was there in sundry. I wasn't there very long, probably 20 minutes, half hour. They got things all kind of stable or figured out what to do. And then they threw me in an ambulance to Calgary. How far a drive is that? Uh, it's about an hour and a half-ish. Oh, okay. Well, that's not so bad. So, Not so bad. So I was attacked at 9.36 a.m. I made it to the hospital that night at 9.17 at night. How long did it take you to get from, like, from the end of the bear attack to to the the lodge? How long was that? So I made it to the lodge about, uh, was it, uh, about 4.30. So it was like six hours it took you to get out of the woods. Well, was, that was a little over 12 kilometers in the bush. And I can crawl out. Good God. <laughs> Man, I, I'm just sitting here trying to think, would, would I have made it? Or would I have, what the well, hell? I got to say ADHD, I think, had a, played a big role, role in it. Oh, okay. Then I would have made it. <laughs> as, a, as, a, yeah. as an ADHD person, you can't wait for things to happen. You got to make it happen. Right? <laughs> You're too impatient to die. <laughs> yeah, like, like I'm going to die. Like, let's. I got to die. Like now, I can't wait for this. Right? Like, it's. I think you know. Well, I mean, one hyper focus too, right? It was like the yeah. hyper focus of getting out of there. I mean, you know, all jokes aside, I think you know ADHD may had a little bit of play in there. I'm more, mostly the drive of my family and everything, but yeah. Um, yeah, I think that being hyper-focused and the fact that you can't sit still, you got to always be doing something, you know. <laughs> Jesus. Huh. Yeah, that would be a long wait sitting in your truck with a stranger for 45 minutes waiting for a helicopter. Maybe, maybe, maybe she should have just let you go fishing. <laughs> it, it was, it was pretty funny. I mean, we had a, uh, yeah, I can joke about it now. It was a pretty serious at the time, but. Oh God, I can imagine. Good Lord, yeah, having your beard on your head. Like your face is on top of your head, tied to. Uh, oh, yeah. Good God. Yeah, it, was a, it was a pretty interesting scene. Um, I remember the ladies were telling me about it uh, afterwards, what it looked like and and just how everything was like black and there's all this dirt in there and just my left eye hanging down, jaw open and. You can see all my teeth and mm. how everything was just kind of dangling. Good uh, Lord. So I, I made it. This is where the, so that this part here to me is the easiest part was the, the bear mauling and getting out. Right. Yeah. I would go fight a bear tomorrow if I knew the outcome. The only thing I don't want to go through again was the PTSD side. Mm-hmm. That was the worst part. And I wish that on, I don't even wish that on my worst enemies. That is, that is hard. So the, I got into hospital and they did uh, 13 hour surgery right away. They woke me up the following day in ICU. And from the moment they woke me up to every time I went to go to sleep, I would wake up in major flashbacks. You know, the bear is coming back. The bear is going to get me. So I'll be, you know, trying to grab things, trying to pull tubes out, just totally reacting. Of course, people would touch my chest and that, and I'd just start hitting them or grabbing them because it's just like what the bear did. I have a, a very good friend. He was there from day one with my wife. And what he would do, every time he'd have a nightmare flashback, he would massage my feet. He would squeeze my feet, and he'd be like, you're in a safe place. You're in a safe place. And that would help me get out of the nightmares or the flashbacks. Hmm. So throughout, throughout the hospital stay, I had to have somebody with me 24-7 to help get me out of those. It would be, and then the strangest things would set it off, like an ice machine. They had one in the hallway, and every time that would go off, I would go right into a flashback because it sounded like your skull being crushed. Jesus. This was a, it was a huge struggle. Uh, I had a sister that used to stay with me at night, and she'd be there all night long. And, of course, as soon as i go into a flashback, she would massage my feet, squeeze my feet, take me out. Like I'm a... A fairly large individual. I'm six foot two, and I was probably about 250 pounds when I got mauled. It was in pretty good shape, so I was. It's pretty hard to stop someone like me swinging around. Uh, we had signs on me, signs on the walls that if I'm in a flashback, squeeze my feet because I've hit a few nurses, a few doctors because you know I go into a flashback and they don't know what to do. Uh, that was really hard. So I was in the hospital a total of five weeks. 
And one day, um, once I got out of the hospital at home, you know, flashbacks. Every time I go take a nap, everything it just constantly. Uh, from day one in the hospital, I asked for psychiatric help. I knew I wasn't able to get past this on my own. I was already seeing somebody for ADHD, uh, and I knew I, I knew I needed help. I knew I wasn't going to be able to get past this on my own because after you know, I saw a therapist with ADHD and how much of a change it made in me, I wasn't going to recover on my own. I needed that help. Hmm. I bet. So, so from day one, I had a we got a, a therapist there. We worked through a lot of things. Like I didn't want to look at myself in the mirror. We actually covered up all the mirrors and everything in the hospital room. I actually I didn't look in the mirror till mid September. That was the first time I ever looked in the mirror. Mm. And on that day, we planned that day. The nurses there in the hospital worked together. They cut my hair for me. They trimmed up my beard, my face. Uh, I didn't have any stitches in my face at that time because this was mid September, about three weeks after the bear mauling. So they made me look really good. My wife got me a nice plaid shirt and uh, they dressed me up. Therapist came in and what we did is we, uh, they took my phone and they took a picture of me or the iPad took a picture of me. And then we, I had a lot of support and a lot of friends there and looked at it for the first time. And I was in shock, you know, um, I actually looked pretty good. I was, I thought it had all kinds of things missing and mm. cause you feel around, nothing feels the same. Like to have no feeling, mm-hmm. you know, and you see all the staples are pulling out. So, um, it, that was good just to have that support. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know what you look like before, but that's probably an improvement. Well, no, you know, my I'm left side it. here looks pretty good. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> but what a story you have now. Oh Lord. Yeah. So I, I, so how many years ago was that? This was a little over five years ago. So, well, how did you, how did you get through the PTSD? Like, how long did that last? To the, like, I mean, I, I suppose it's a spectrum, right? It, from like flipping out every time you nap to, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm assuming you're still having issues. Actually, today I'm doing pretty good. Uh, so throughout several years after the attack, we figured out when most of the triggers were. At the time, I worked at a slaughterhouse. And the first time I smelled blood, I went into a flashback. Mm. And so, okay, there's a trigger. I would keep a, a daily journal and keep track of what the stresses were, what things I did for help possible triggers. And if I had nightmares, I write down what the nightmare was about, um, what happened, what I did that day, what did I eat? Because uh, being a person with ADHD, you got to, consistency is key. Hmm. And same when it comes to PTSD, consistency is key so you can help find the triggers. That, that's what it was for me. Hmm. But I'd write down everything, keep track. Uh, and then I'd look at it back with my therapist. We'd go through it and see, oh, okay, so the sound of plastic breaking or ice pushes you in the flashbacks. So now train your brain to change that from your skull cracking to actually what it is. And just avoiding those areas, avoiding the blood, the smell, just, you know, there's lots of things we talk about and, and try to figure out the triggers for the first three years. It was, we kind of got under control and then it started getting really bad again. Uh, we didn't know why, um, it's as strange as the things it ended up being that I was working out. And that was causing me to have severe flashbacks. And it was to the point where I was only sleeping about 12 hours a week. Hmm. I couldn't get, every time I'd close my eyes, bang, and wake up right away. And it was weird. Um, before the attack, the year I got mauled, I I was uh, had a personal trainer. I was getting into shape. And that's what I did. Well, now, you know, four years later, three and a half years later, I'm trying to get back into shape again because I got out of shape due to the recovery and trying to, so who knew that that would be a trigger? It, it's strange how PTSD works. Mm-hmm. So when we figured that one out, then it was trying to, how do you treat that? Or how do you get past that? Um, where it hit an all time low for me was, uh, about a year, a little over a year ago, I got home early from work and I beat my wife home and, uh, my daughter, and she's still pretty young. They came home. And I was sleeping on the couch. I fell asleep on the couch. My eyes don't close. Like, this is me with my eyes closed. Hmm. 
It's a. Uh, it's great for babysitting. <laughs> you can work security. That's right. <laughs> so my daughter uh, thought I was awake, and she come running in the house. Being a young kid, she wants to jump on and play with daddy. Oh no! So she come running in, and she jumped on me. And now to wake me up at this time, you had to squeeze my feet to wake me up. In other words, I go into a severe flashback. So she jumps on me. I grab her, I threw her across the room. Mm. She got hurt. My wife is sitting here trying to hold me down, trying to wake me up, trying to deal with my daughter. You know, I wake up, I'm confused. I whack my head. There's blood over the place. And I don't know where I am. You know, the bear's coming. And I, I wake up confused. And that was very, very hard. That was like a very scary moment for me. Mm-hmm. This can't be how, you know, life goes on, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I made an appointment right away with my therapist. And let her know, like you know, this is we need. I need to do. We need to do something. We need to try something different. And she was researching. I was researching. Uh, managed to get into this program called ART, Accelerated Resolution Therapy, which is a uh, rapid eye movement and voluntary image replacement. ART is a short term accelerated resolution therapy. Okay, and. It, uh, you know, I, I was going to give it a try. So we got into the session and this is where, this is where keeping an open mind is very helpful because you get in there and what they do is they basically wave a hand in front of your face and you replay the scene in your head. At first I'm sitting there thinking, what the heck is this? Like, is this voodoo magic? Like, you know, you wave a hand in front of my face. <laughs> What's it going to do? Uh, but if you think like that, it's not going to help you. Mm-hmm. I just, you know, like, let's give it a try. Let's try it. Let's try to focus exactly on what they're telling me. And that's what I did. I did the, the first session was 45 minutes. That night I slept for seven to eight hours straight. No nightmares. Hmm. None. Total shock to me. It was, it was totally changed my life. I did three total sessions over two and a half months. And since then I've had, couple very minor nightmares right around when the book came out. And I recently, I had one that my wife had to wake me up from, but, and that's in over a year, which is incredible. And what they got to say, you know, for treating for PTSD, don't just give up with one, with one type of treatment. Keep trying. There is one out there that will work for you. Don't give up. And even though you don't think it's working for you, it takes time. Your mind takes time to heal. And you will eventually, you, it will help. Hmm. Just keep, just keep kicking. Just keep trying. Huh? Yeah. I'm intrigued on this, this ART. Like, uh, I've heard, have you heard of EMDR? It's like yeah. eye movement yeah. thing too. It's like you go, you, I, I, I'm interviewing someone uh, in a couple of weeks about it too. She's a, like, that's her mode of therapy she gives people. So I, I'm looking forward to that because I've heard of it many times and I don't understand it. Um, so there's ART, like that you, so you have to, re, it's basically, you have to relive the trauma. Then you're sitting there, they're telling you Correct. to, as a, as a, which is like, you want to do the opposite, right? You're like, you, um, I don't want to think about the shit anymore. Like, so now they're making you while they're waving well, their hand the, in your face. Yeah, <laughs> well, And it's weird, but they said to think about it as if you're like in a drone or, or if you want to be there on the scene. So think about you're in a drone and somebody else fighting the bear, or you're controlling it, or you're the guy fighting the bear. And then they go through, like, go through the first 20 minutes of the attack. And then they stop, you know, like, do you feel any kind of anxiety or any pressure anywhere? And you're like, yeah, I feel a little bit in my chest. Okay, well, think about that pressure. Think about what it feels like. And then they wave a hand in front of your face again, and then you just breathe, they tell you to breathe into that space and think about that. And then after a couple of minutes to say, do you still have it? Or did it move somewhere else? Well, yes, now it's in my right leg. He's using mm-hmm. as an example. Mm-hmm. So breathe into that space, think about it and process it. And it's really weird. And it, like I said, it was, I was totally amazed. Um, hmm. it, totally, totally a game changer for me. And what, one of the, one of the things that uh, kind of proved it was me and my daughter were playing a uh, big game Cabela's Hunter. <laughs> or Cabela's Big Game Hunter and we're chasing caribou up in Alaska and I haven't played this game in many many years 
So as you're playing this game, a grizzly bear pops out, jumps on you, and starts ripping and tearing at your face. So I'm sitting there playing this. My wife is there. This bear jumps out. You know, I fight the bear off. And I'm like, yeah, time to turn this game off. You know, put it away. Hmm. That night, my wife stayed up all night thinking that was going to be a rough night. But I slept solid throughout the night. Hmm. When before, if a bear came on screen or a sound of one, I wouldn't sleep that night. And so that was, you know... That's how effective it was for me. Hmm. My therapist told me I shouldn't play that game after that. She said, <laughs> I recommend you just tossing that one out. Don't uh, don't keep testing yourself. <laughs> yeah. uh, my wife does a thing called body talk, and it's uh, it's it's also very weird. And you have to kind of have an open mind. And it's um, it's kind of similar. It's like your body will physically hold in different spots trauma and stuff, and then they do like this tappy thing and I don't know what the hell she does, but it's kind of like voodoo, witch magic stuff too. But, but it's amazing. Yeah. Like yeah, it's same thing. It's like some people just absolutely swear by it. And it's amazing. Like who fucking knows what works or how your brain works or what the hell happens. Yeah. And I like to describe it as uh, like nowadays, electronics, you got to hold like three different buttons down to reset a clock or something. Right. Right. And, <laughs> yeah. and it's so difficult yet. Like with this ART, it was like the same thing. They're trying to reset your brain. So, you know, like put your left leg in the air, do the hokey pokey. Like it's, it's weird how it works, huh. but it was very effective for me. Good. Good. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, so, so what kind of, if you get on the, if you get your 5 million and you, you get a, the get on the board for uh PTSD the, research. Is there some things that are already in mind that you want to, you, you want to look into? Well, I'd like to look into more of the uh, treatment and a little bit of research side. So uh, how a uh, endowed chair position works at a university is uh, you pick the, the kind of study that you want to go into, or you want the chair to go into. And I'm picking on for PTSD research on PTSD and treatment for individuals with, the, uh, say, with ADHD or different levels, the chemical levels in their brain. I don't have the, I can't pronounce all the scientific words for it, but yeah, I'm working on that. I'm just a chair. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm not the chair. I'm just all the right, one right. that I'm trying to raise the money. And then once the money is raised and you get a, and, and it's endowed, which means the money is there forever. Hmm. Uh, they don't touch the five million. All the money generated off the five million of it being invested runs the department for the research. Gotcha. So when they, so then they go into a process of hiring a chair member and the chair member will carry on the, will drive the research and can go out and get more funding to help fund the project or fund the research. And then it just grows and grows and grows. And then they have to share, you know, globally what research is. Um, I'm not saying it, this is bad or anything about, you know, I can give it to an organization, work with certain groups with PTSD. I don't want to, uh, that would help a small amount of people. I want to help a large amount of people. I want something to be there forever. I want to start something that I want it to grow and be there forever and be able to help people all around the world, just not little pockets here and there. Mm. This is where I think the best use of that money is. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. Yeah. I've never heard of this and it makes sense. Like you said, it's, it'll just be forever research now. And, Correct. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's what excites me. You know, I mean, like, there's lots of good organizations out there for PTSD. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. There's lots of them. And I was trying to find one, which one do I want to work with? Which one shares the same views as me, you know, and which, and there's some decent fits. Uh, and I'm like, but if I give them money, like how many people is that actually going to affect? Mm -hmm. You know, $5 million to say we go to a thousand people, but where like that $5 million can go to a million people over a lifetime, right? So it would be better mm -hmm. for me. I think that's the better way to go. Every psychologist on earth could benefit from the research that could possibly come out of that. Correct. Yeah. 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 And that's and it used down the road. Like, I mean, you won't see results tomorrow, mm -hmm. but 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, there might be mega results. And that's what I'm more into building the future. I'm more of a futuristic person. Mm -hmm. And I guess there's all types of PTSD too, right? From like chronic to acute. Like I, I would, I would say yours is more acute. It was like, a, it was, you know, super traumatic in a, like a 10 minute span where other people like for 10 years or an, an abusive, you know, relationships and all types of stuff. And then. 
So then that might be a different type of treatment would work for them or as opposed to an acute kind of trauma. Correct. And then, all, and also too, I think, I think that, uh, like your serotonin and dopamine in your brain may pay, play a part of it too. Like if you're ADHD, are you going to have the same treatment as a non ADHD person with trauma? Cause each person deals with it differently. And so I'm, I'm kind of interested in like the, the chemical levels in your brain, how that affects treatment. It does it. Mm-hmm. Is there different ways we need to approach it? And so that's where that intrigues me. And because I have ADHD, that's one of the areas I think, you know, there's a lot of ADHD people that suffer from trauma and there needs to be more research and more help for those individuals. I'm not saying that war vets or anything don't need treatment, but mm-hmm. this is just kind of more the area I want to go towards. So having ADHD and being trying to recover from PTSD, was it, do they, do they say it's harder for people with ADHD to recover from PTSD or is it just different? Each, each person is different. Hmm. Um, and, you know, all I was going to say is as an ADHD person, you want to give up when things get tough. It's all or nothing, <laughs> that's, baby. That's, yeah. You got to go and, and keep an open mind. It's really hard to keep an open mind when you're doing some of these things. Cause as an ADHD person, your mind's running that 1200 to 1800 words a minute. You know, someone's waving their hand in front of your face. You're thinking, this is hokey. Get out of here. I don't trust you. <laughs> right? Hurry, hurry up you and cure me. <laughs> that's right. You just... You just got to take that deep breath and relax and trust them. They're, they're experts in their field for a reason and keep an open mind. And it's very, very tough. That's an ADHD person. Uh, Trust me. It's very tough. (laughs) Yeah. I found that with, in recovery with addiction, it was like, okay, I quit drinking. Why aren't I feeling better? And it's like, I was sober for a week. You know, it's like, oh, oh, fuck. It takes years. God damn it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I'm feeling much better now though. Uh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, are you, are you, are you happy with the way you look and your, your, your wife isn't like, doesn't look at you weird. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, cause that would be a, a, a bit of a, a mind fuck too, is like looking in the mirror and not accepting your new appearance and, and you know, that, that was very tough because on the right side of my skull here, and there's two divots in my skull hmm. and they're down, they were down about seven and eight millimeters right? So there, uh, there's bone and plate there and this, the skin when the scalp was moved right off my skull. So they're exposed bone. And during the time of the hospital, they were trying to patch it up and, uh, they moved a piece of my head over and that skin started or the, that patch of flesh started to die. So they put it back and then they just covered it with skin grab. Hmm. Well, those two divots used to bother me quite a bit. I look in the mirror, you know, when you take a shower and water would build up in them and then they're like purple and ugly. And, uh, those used to give me some anxiety. Um, you know, my face looking used to bug me. I wore a hat or, a or like a neck gaiter over my head to cover it for quite a while. And now I'm like, whatever I get half price haircuts, you know, like it's, <laughs> There's just so many things you can look to, that come all the good out of it. So, uh, I don't, I don't wear a hat much anymore. I, I don't mind showing it off. I don't care if people stare. It's, it's a part of me and I'm proud of it. Like this is, I survived something traumatic and this is, yeah, this is yeah, like a trophy, I guess. I, I'm guessing some people think you're fucking badass. You fought a fucking I, bear, man. You had your face ripped <laughs> off and. You fucking drove to a helicopter. <laughs> like, like, fuck. Hey, it is. I get a Bear lot. Of, I get a lot. Of, yeah. The grizzly dude. Grizzly I get a dude. lot. Of, I get a lot of, a lot of people sending me messages about how I'm, they're a hero and all that. I don't, I wouldn't call myself a hero. I'm just a, you know, a guy that, uh, it's rejected bear bait, really. <laughs> <laughs> fuck. That must have been terrible. Like, were you scared she was coming back too? like through that whole 12 kilometer hike to your truck? Yes and no. Um, after I fired a couple of shots and I fell down the mountainside, I kind of forgot all about the bear. I was like, whatever, she comes back already at this point, I've accepted my fate hmm. and I didn't care. Ah, okay. But through the PTSD struggles, yeah, that's, she was always coming back. Hmm. Uh, uh, God. Well, did you see that movie? Uh, what's his name's in it? He's attacked by a bear. And- the Revit? Yeah, yeah. The Revenant, yeah, like uh, they played that. The nurses played that for me in the hospital. No, yeah, they did. 
And they're like, you should watch this movie. Because I in the hospital, I joked around with the nurses. We had a lot of fun together. Um, I had some very great nurses. And just seeing the stress they go through in a day, they want to come to see me because I joke with them. And I was never, I was never a needy person. I kind of... I didn't really want them to wait on me hand and foot. And then you see. You just wanted no ice and no straw. Basically, yeah. <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah, just keeping, I, I joke about and have fun. So they, so I had a pretty good sense of humor. So they turned on the Revenant and we watched the bear scene where the bear fights the guy. And I'm like, oh, that guy's a wuss. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't, fr- it, that it was, didn't freak you out? It did a little bit. Like I said, it did cause some nightmares, but you know what? You got to, you're pushing your limits. I was, but it was just, I don't know. It just had to, like you just, I, I just wanted to see you. I, I would have too. Yeah. I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you'd never seen the movie before the bear attack. No, never have. Huh. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> Cause yeah. The only movie I seen with a bear attack was, uh, the edge. Oh, that's old. Or no. Very old. Yeah. yeah, the edge with Anthony Hopkins. Yes. And... Okay. Yeah. Baldwin. Yeah, that was like. Yes. Right. That, that was back in the early two thousands, or was it late nineties? And they shot that somewhere around there, didn't they? Or are they? No, it was in BC. I think they shot it. Yeah, I'm not sure. Nah, it doesn't matter. Well, oh, well, what's the name of your book, and where can people find your stuff? And yeah, so the name of the book is uh, "Mauled Lessons Learned from a Grizzly Bear Attack." Uh, you can find the book on uh, Amazon or at your local bookstore, cha- uh, Indigo Chapters. Uh, there's lots of little bookstores out there that also carry it, or bookstores like uh, Stacy's Happy Place in Eckville, Alberta. Uh, it's in quite a few bookstores in Red Deer, Calgary. You can also buy the book, a signed copy of the book on my webpage, uh, grizzlydude.ca. And there you get a, a signed copy of the book and then you get some you get a fancy bookmark with uh, all my all my sayings, like you know, you're unbearably awesome. <laughs> you could you could bear it even when you think you can't. Uh, the bear necessities. Teddy, you know, oh, that's a good one. Um, I have another one like not all teddy bears are friendly. And then remember, don't poke the bear. <laughs> you you got to have fun with it. <laughs> yeah. Now that you aren't throwing fits of fear in the middle of the night. Yeah, you can. I suppose, I mean, I guess even then you were probably having some, some fun with it. Oh, I totally, I, you gotta have fun with it. I mean, it, it is a tragic thing and I use humor to help, uh, cope with things. So that, that was one of the, one of the other things is, you know, keep a smile on your face and always think of the good things. Right. Don't focus on the bad. And when you're in these tough situations, think about your family, because that's one of the most powerful forces on this planet is your family. And the love for them can get you through some of the most harshest things. Believe me, trust me on that one. Hmm. You haven't met my family. No, I'm kidding. I'm, kidding. <laughs> I, I'm sure I could find some good in them. <laughs> I mean, they're sticking with me, so they got to be pretty good. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jeremy. What a great man you are. You're just so pleasant. <laughs> uh, actually, Jeremy and I have been, uh, well, I say this quite often, but uh, I've made a new friend. And uh, it's its really great. Uh, we've swapped books. Uh, his is Mauled, Lessons Learned from a Grizzly Bear Attack. It's got to be an easier way to learn a lesson. But anyway... Uh, him and I are actually planning on doing some speaking together and, uh, we're working on, on that. Uh, we're both ADHD, so, uh, you know, (laughs) we'll see if it actually works out, but, uh, I, I, we really want to do that. So anyway, uh, great guy. Thanks, Jeremy. And I I can't wait to see you raise $5 million. Anywho, don't forget next week I'm speaking with Laura, Aaron, and Christy. Um, we're talking about. Um, people that work in with animals and, and their mental health and their mental well-being because it's, it's extremely stressful. So yeah, that's next week. Also this coming Monday, April 17th, I'm speaking with Bonnie Faith on Instagram Live. And hey, if you like mental health podcasts and you, you want to check another one out, please feel free to check this one out. It's called Feel Free, and it's a general wellness podcast run by John Sroan, a recovering addict with a mission to help people better understand their habits so they can achieve their true potential in order to chase their dreams. 
With the help of some charismatic guests, the topics and conversations covered range from addiction, diet, exercise, burnout, to mental health, and so much more. Uh, and that's with John Cerrone, and he's going to be on the podcast uh, in the coming weeks. And uh, you never know, I might make an appearance on his. So um, be sure to, you know, support support other mental health podcasts as well. Thanks again to Sun, Saskatchewan Union of Nurses, and thank you for listening. And please remember to, to tell other people about the podcast. Lots of people are, are relating with my guests and are learning lots and, uh, you know, it's it's helping lots of people. So, uh, so please help someone else and tell tell someone about the podcast and also please don't forget to make your beds and take your meds bye